Okay, so the last time we were looking at um, errors and in, in inverses and solutions to linear systems. A related concept that we saw was uh, the concept of compatible norms. And compatible norms are norms such that they satisfy a sub multiplicativity type property, but with a combination of a vector norm and a, and a matrix norm. So specifically, if there is a vector norm such that AX is less than or equal to the norm of A times the vector norm of X, then this vector norm and this matrix norm are said to be compatible. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, so based on this, we were uh, looking at bounding the errors in computing uh, solutions to linear systems or equations. We saw one formulation and the, towards the end of the previous class, we saw this other formulation where we look at a perturbed system this one here. So where the matrix A and the right hand side B are both perturbed by a matrix A delta and a vector B delta multiplied by some small number epsilon. And we are interested in understanding the first order behavior of how the solution X epsilon is related to the solution X as this for, for very small values of epsilon. And so this is what we call the perturbed system. And we showed that if you look at the relative error in X due to perturbations, that is the norm of X epsilon minus X divided by the norm of X, that can be written as, uh, that can be upper bounded by epsilon times the condition number of A with respect to some norm, which is actually a compatible norm with the norm used to evaluate this relative error in X. So this times the relative error in B Actually, epsilon times this is the relative error in B and epsilon times norm of A delta over A is the relative error in A plus a term which is order of epsilon squared. So if epsilon is small enough, this term will dominate this term and so you can drop this term. And uh, essentially what, uh, what we said is if, yeah, so as I mentioned, the relative error in B is epsilon times norm of B delta divided by norm of B. We'll call this rho b and similarly rho a is epsilon times norm of a delta over norm of a. Then we can upper bound this relative error in x as the condition number times rho a plus plus order of epsilon squared. So this is the punchline that to a first order approximation, the relative error in the computed solution um, x of epsilon is bounded by the condition number of A times the sum of the two relative errors. Okay, so that's what that's where we stopped in the previous class. And again, it brings out the fact that if you have a well-conditioned matrix, K of A will be close to one. And so uh, the error in the solution is going to be of the same order as the error in A or B. Whereas if uh, A is a poorly conditioned matrix, K of A will be a large number. So the error in the solution will be much larger than the error in either A or B. It's not will be, it's the, this is the bound we have on this. So again, um, it's possible that for specific A's and specific right hand sides B, the error, relative error in the solution may not be as big as this. It doesn't mean that it will always be as big as this, but this is the bound we are able to get. Okay, so let's continue. So now that concludes this uh, chapter on norms. So now I'm moving. Sir, a question. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, now that we uh, derived this thing uh, uh, for uh, same epsilon for uh, matrix A and B, that is same perturbation parameter. Mm. Mm. So um, if the epsilon is different from for A and B, will the mm. final formula that uh, Relative error plus B plus relative error in A times condition number will hold. 
So these are all just upper bounds. Okay, so if you want to perturb them by different amounts, uh, a simple fix to this is to take epsilon to be the max of the two epsilons. And oh. everything we're saying here is valid. Here we're just looking at the first order behavior, the sensitivity to small perturbations in A or B. And the punchline is again that whatever is the relative error in B plus the relative error in A, that gets amplified by this coefficient K of A. Yes. Okay, so we'll continue. So now I come to actually chapter one of uh, the Horn and Johnson textbook, which is on eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, so Sir, the, yeah. Yeah, uh, can you scroll, scroll up a little bit? Yeah, I'll, I'll, no scroll up in the first page. Yeah. He, uh, sir, again, somewhere you have written. Sir, is this see, uh, is this normal matrix norm for A? What you have written? Like, ha, huh, good question. Like, this should have been the matrix norm. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. The typo. This is the same matrix norm that is used here to compute the condition number of A. Okay, so now we come to, you know, you sort of have to rewire your brain a little bit and uh, this is a different topic. It's eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Again, a super important topic from the point of view of uh, matrix theory. So the fundamental equation of eigenvalues and eigenvectors is very simple. It's stated right here, AX equals lambda X. And here A is an N cross N matrix and x is an n by 1 vector. Lambda is a scalar. OK, and so lambda belongs to C. And uh, x can be any vector as long as it's not the all zero vector. Of course, the all zero vector will satisfy this equation, but we don't care about that. That's a trivial solution. So for non zero x, if you can find a vector x and a scalar lambda such that AX equals lambda X, we call this pair X and lambda as uh, an eigenvalue. Okay, this is not correct. To be sort of consistent, this is an eigenvector eigenvalue pair. Okay, and the key thing, I, the reason I underline this here is because these always occur in pairs. OK, so you, you associate an eigenvalue and associated with any eigenvalue. I mean, you can cannot define an eigenvalue without saying that there is an x not equal to zero such that x a x equals lambda x. And similarly, you can't say that x is an eigenvector without saying that for some complex valued lambda, a x equals lambda x holds. So they're always in pairs. OK, so just to motivate there, here are two quick, simple examples where eigenvalues and eigenvectors matter. So suppose you want to find a solution to this differential equation here, du over dt equals au. Here a is some constant matrix, which is independent of t, but u is a function of t and you're trying to solve for u of t. u of t is a vector, okay, and it's evolving with time. And the way it evolves is such that it satisfies this differential equation du by dt equals au. Of course, in the scalar case, you've uh, certainly seen this in your undergraduate program. If you, if I give you this equation du by dt equals au, you will take u to down there and dt up here, and then you'll integrate both sides. You will get log u is equal to at, and from that you get u is equal to some constant times e power at, where the value of the constant depends on the initial condition, uh, that is the value of u at t equals zero. So uh, if somebody tells you what the value of u at t equals zero is, you can find what this constant is, and you know that this is the solution. 
So if I had to do this and say what happens in the matrix case, I could potentially think about writing capital A in the exponential here. But for now, just consider u is equal to e power lambda t times x, where x is an eigenvalue of a, um, and sorry, lambda is an eigenvalue of a, and x is an eigenvector of a. Um, this, uh, if, if I make this substitution, u is equal to e power lambda t times x, um, if I substitute that, uh, if, um, yeah, so how do I, how do I explain this to you? Um, so a times u will be a times e power lambda t times x, which is equal to e power lambda t is a scalar. So I can take that out of the multiplication. So it's e power lambda t times ax. And ax is the same as lambda x because lambda and x are an eigenvalue eigenvector pair. So a times u is equal to lambda times e power lambda t times x. So basically um, a u will be equal to lambda times u. And um, and then if I consider du by dt, so if I differentiate this with respect to t, the only thing that depends on t is just this e power lambda t and its derivative is lambda e power lambda t. And so du by dt is also equal to lambda times e power lambda t times x, which is equal to lambda times u. So a u is lambda times u and du by dt is also equal to lambda times u. So it satisfies this differential equation. And more generally, u can be written as a linear combination of solutions of this form corresponding to different eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now, now another, another problem is, uh, suppose you want to solve a constrained optimization problem, such as maximize x transpose ax subject to the constraint x transpose x equals one, where A is a real valued matrix, which is also symmetric. So A equals A transpose. Then um, the conventional approach is to use the method of Lagrange multipliers, where you define this Lagrangian function. L, which is A x transpose AX minus lambda times x transpose x. Then if we differentiate this with respect to x, now this is a vector derivative. Um, so you'll have to take this on faith, but the simple explanation is that the way to differentiate with respect to a vector is to differentiate with respect to each of the components of the vector partially, and then stack them together as a, as a vector. Okay, the def derivative of a scalar with respect to a vector is a vector whose dimension equals the dimension of the vector and the entries are equal to the derivatives of uh, the, the uh, scalar with respect to each of the components stacked one above the other. And if you do that for this particular Lagrangian function, it is not difficult to show that the derivative is two times ax minus lambda x. And so if you set the derivative equal to zero, you get this equation here, two times ax minus lambda x equals zero or in other words, ax equals lambda x, which is the eigenvalue eigenvector equation. So these are two simple examples where eigenvalues and eigenvectors arise naturally when you're trying to solve some problems. And here is an example to just visualize um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Uh, so suppose A is the simple two cross two matrix with entries four, one, one, four. If I take x1 to be this vector 1, 0. Then ax1 will be um, the first column of this matrix, which is 4, 1. So here I show that in red. So x1 is the vector 1, 0. And ax1 is going along this direction. The x component is 4 and the y component is 1. 
And similarly, if I take X2 to be 0, 1, then AX2 is the second column of this matrix, which is 1, 4. And that is shown in green here. AX2 is in this. So you see that X1 and X2, um, sorry, X1 and AX1 point in different directions. X2 is like this. AX2 is pointing in a different direction. Whereas if I choose X3 to be 1, 1, then when I do AX3, I get 5, 5, which is 5 times this vector X3. So it points in the same direction as x3 so that is shown in black here so similarly if i take x4 is 1 minus 1 then ax4 will be 3 minus 3 which is also pointing in the same direction it is 3 times 1 minus 1 so these eigenvectors are very special vectors where when you multiply the matrix by the eigenvector you get a vector that is pointing in the same direction as the original vector Okay, so how do we find these uh, eigenvalues? I guess you guys know this already. So I'll just quickly, for the sake of completeness, discuss this. So consider A to be an N cross N matrix. It could be complex also, the same thing. Whatever I'm going to say holds for complex also. So if we consider the equation AX equals lambda X, this implies that A minus lambda times the identity matrix times this vector x, x equals 0. And this kind of an equation where you have a matrix times a vector equals 0, this is called a homogeneous equation. The right hand side is 0. That, that's when it's called a homogeneous equation. Okay, so uh, one thing is that we, we wanted these eigenvectors to be non-zero vectors. Of course, if I set x equals zero, this will satisfy this equation, but we don't want that solution. So if x should be non-zero, that means that this a minus lambda i must have a non-trivial null space. Or, in other words, lambda is such that A minus lambda I is singular. So at this point, it should look a little magical to you. So we see lambda I is a highly structured matrix. It's just a scaled version of the identity matrix. By subtracting lambda times I from A, I'm able to arrive, no matter what A is, if I take the right scaling lambda here and do A minus lambda I, the columns of A, A minus lambda I, should become linearly dependent. Okay, And then this matrix should become singular. So I'm looking for such kind of lambdas. And if I want this matrix to be singular, one way to test it is to find its determinant. And whenever the determinant of this matrix goes to zero, we know that uh, this A minus lambda I is um, is going to be ranked deficient and this matrix will be singular. So the determinant gives us a test. So lambda is an eigenvalue if and only if determinant of A minus lambda I equals zero. So this is uh, this is very a very crucial observation that lambda is an eigenvalue if and only if this determinant of a minus lambda i goes to zero. Obviously, if determinant of a minus lambda i is zero, then it means that the a minus lambda i is singular, and therefore you will be able to find a non-zero vector x such that a minus lambda i times x is equal to zero. Contrarywise, if if lambda is indeed an eigenvalue of a it implies from the definition that there is a non-zero x such that a x equals lambda x or a minus lambda i times x equals zero for some x not equal to zero, which means that the matrix A must be singular. So, and therefore its determinant must be equal to zero. So these two statements, uh, the, these two uh, points are actually an if and only if statement. A lambda is an eigenvalue of A, and determinant of a minus lambda i equals 0 are if and only if conditions. 
And this equation determinant of lambda a minus lambda i equals zero is called what? Yes. It's called the characteristic equation. It's a polynomial of degree n. Okay, that comes about if you simply expand this definition from the definition of the determinant, you will see that this will be a polynomial of degree n. And uh, so, and also corresponding to any eigenvalue lambda, there will always exist at least one non-zero eigenvector by definition. Okay, they always occur in pairs. I'm repeating my point. So, so that that's it. So this is how we find the eigenvalues. We have to set the characteristic equation or find the solutions or roots of the characteristic equation, and that gives us all the eigenvalues of the matrix. So again, for example, if uh, I consider the matrix 4, 2, minus 5, and minus 3, then if I consider determinant of a minus lambda i equals, so if I, so let's see, determinant of, um, so this is my a, so let's say, a, a minus lambda i is the determinant of 4 minus lambda minus 5, 2, and minus 3 minus lambda, which is equal to 4 minus lambda minus 3 minus lambda plus 10. Okay, and if I set this equal to zero, then I'll get, so you have to simplify this, so that will give you lambda minus lambda times lambda is lambda squared, and three lambda minus four lambda gives me minus lambda. Okay, and then I have minus 12 over here, but there's a plus 10, so I'm left with minus two equals zero. And the solutions to this are, lambda equals minus one or plus two, okay? So, um, so if I now compute, so these are the two eigenvalues of this matrix. And if I now compute uh, A minus lambda one times the identity, so let's call this lambda one, and let's call this lambda two. Then this times, if I take x1 to be a corresponding eigenvector, this will be equal to uh, five, two, five times two times. Now, the slight abuse of notation, I'll call this vector x1. So I'll call this x1, x2. And I set this equal to zero, and I want to solve for what x1, x2 satisfies this. Um, it's easy to verify that x1 is the vector 1, 1. If I just take 1, 1 here, this could become zero, this becomes zero. And similarly, if I take a minus lambda 2i times x2, that becomes this minus so 4 minus 2 is 2, and uh, this is 2, and this is minus 5, and minus 3 minus 2 is minus 5 again. This times, say, x1 dash, x2 dash equals 0. That implies the vector x2 is equal to, I can just take it to be 5 comma 2. So notice that basically if I take a minus lambda 1i, that is this matrix, the column of this is 5, 2, and that gives me x2. And similarly, if I do a minus lambda 2i, that gives me this column, and that is going to be equal to 
x1. Okay, so I'll just uh, maybe just for I'll just indicate it like this. So this is something that is an interesting observation that the columns of a minus lambda to i actually give you x1, the eigenvector corresponding to the first eigenvalue, and vice versa. So this only works for two by two matrices. It doesn't work for larger dimensional matrices, but uh, nonetheless, it's an interesting observation. Um, so basically, um, when I multiply a with a vector x, uh, most vectors will not satisfy ax equals lambda x. Only special numbers are um, eigenvalues and special vectors are eigenvectors. Normally, if I take ax, it will scale the different components of x by different amounts and it will rotate the vector x and so it won't point in the same direction. The ones that point in the same direction are called eigenvectors and there is a corresponding scaling factor which is denoted by or de which is defined to be the eigenvalue. Okay, so this is the basic notion of eigenvalue and eigenvectors and how to find eigenvalues and once you found the eigenvalues you compute a minus lambda i for each eigenvalue and you find one vector in the non-trivial null space of a minus lambda i and that gives you uh, an eigen or rather you find a basis for the span of the null space of this matrix and that gives you the eigenvectors corresponding to that eigenvalue so now uh, there's Sir? a couple of more definitions yes uh, there, there is not any restriction on A, right? I mean, A only should be a square matrix. It can be singular as well. Still, uh, eigenvalue and eigenvector will exist. Yes. So basically, if A is singular, then there is an X which is non-zero such that AX equals zero. But of course, I can write zero as zero times X. So then it satisfies AX equals lambda X where lambda equals zero. So if A is singular, then certainly you can say that lambda equal to zero is one of the eigenvalues. Yeah, yes, sir. 